This channel is part of the History Hit Network. Britain's longest reigning monarch, mother of nine, grandmother of Europe and Empress of India, Queen Victoria ruled in a century of revolution, turbulence that crossed other European monarchs their thrones, while Victoria reigned supreme. Yet Victoria, that great figurehead of empire, was at all times a woman who formed intimate relationships with those around her, some conventional, some not so conventional. But perhaps the Queen's most enduring relationship was that with her pen. She was one of the 19th century's most prolific diarists. From childhood to widowhood, she put her thoughts onto paper, matters of state, family gossip, current affairs, diplomacy and death, she recorded her thoughts on everything and everybody. She was famously terse, frequently enraged, passionately romantic, and she poured her emotions out onto paper. Those close to her were afraid her more alarming opinions might escape in written form, causing havoc. The poor woman is bodily and morally the husband's slave. That always sticks in my throat. Much of her writing was destroyed after her death and a great deal, unfortunately, edited by her daughter Beatrice. What survives frequently reveals a woman quite different to the one we think we know, the solid black-clad matron. I've spent the last five years reading through Queen Victoria's journals and through thousands of her unpublished letters. I've almost come to regard her as a friend. There are those who would dismiss her as a hysterical egomaniac. But for me, she is a human being of passion, yes, of enormous eccentricity, but also somebody, contrary to what's so often said about her, who was easily amused. Her writings are the key to understanding factors that shaped Victoria's personality, the tortured relationship with her mother, the dominant men she clung to in search of a father figure, the power struggle, that made her marriage to Prince Albert a battleground. I want to use her papers to try to read the mind of the woman who ruled the world. She was a daughter, a wife, a mother, the queen of a growing empire. Friends and family came and went. It was her pen which was her constant companion and friend. Despite running the most powerful nation on earth, throughout her reign, Queen Victoria always found time for her journal. She used her pen therapeutically to express her innermost thoughts, which is why her writings are so much more than just a record of events. Many of them are kept at the Royal Archives at Windsor Castle. Oliver Urquhart Irvin is the librarian there, it isn't easy to decipher her handwriting, but it's worth the effort. Here in widowhood, she recalls happy times with Prince Albert. Oh, look, here we are, December the 27th, 1860, at Windsor. Sir. My angel always drove me from a seat behind, Hand. sitting okay. astride with his feet in large, large boots, boots and his fur-lined coat with fur gloves. Yeah. And he enjoyed it so much, and it was so pretty. Yes, that's a very touching one, actually, because that's when she's in the first throes of grief and she's writing out happy memories. The noiseless moving of the sledge. It's almost like a Russian novel, isn't it? History Hit is a streaming platform that is just for history fans, with fantastic documentaries covering fascinating figures and moments in history from all over the world. We've got unrivaled access to the world's leading historians, with hundreds of documentaries featuring everything from Boudicca to the British royal family. We're committed to bringing history fans award-winning documentaries and podcasts that you cannot find anywhere else. Sign up now for a free trial, and Real Royalty fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use code REALROYALTY at checkout. If Victoria's works were to be bound as a collection, 
there would be some 700 volumes, more than 50 million words. The volume, I mean, it's colossal, isn't it? Uh, the volume of correspondence, uh, of writing of papers, is, of course, colossal. One would expect to find Victoria's writings in almost every archive in the world uh, and in many personal and private archives. Indeed, yes. Um, Specifically thinking of the journal, actually, which is enormous, isn't it? It is indeed enormous, <laughs> yes. Once she'd begun this habit, perhaps prompted by her mother, of keeping a journal, it became a habit for the rest of her life. Yes, we're very fortunate that, uh, indeed, that she kept such a journal. It provides a fantastic, observational, vivid and honest account of, uh, of her life. It's an extraordinary survival. Of course, the later volumes, Princess Beatrice's, are in her hand rather than Queen Victoria's. Victoria was never afraid to speak her mind. And we don't know whether she'd have wanted her diaries edited. Oliver, however, has no doubts. Why did Princess Beatrice copy her mother's journals rather than just leaving the mother's journals as they were? Well, she was asked to. Um, by whom? By her mother. If you bear in mind that the diaries were written for Queen Victoria by herself and not necessarily with posterity in mind, there came a realisation towards the end that some exercise in editing, perhaps even redaction in some places, to avoid offending members of the family or others indeed, uh, where Queen Victoria had, at the moment of writing, felt able to be fully and freely expressive. The sweetness and spiciness of what survived her edit simply stokes our interest in what Beatrice cut out. How much more was there, for instance, about the fraught relationship between the Queen and her mother? The dynamics of the first relationship Victoria ever knew deeply affected her whole life. It is said that the death of Prince Albert in 1861 was the greatest tragedy of Queen Victoria's life. But it wasn't the first. The death of her mother, nine months earlier, provoked a tsunami of emotions which stirred up intense inner conflicts. It is dreadful. Dreadful to think we shall never see that dear, kind, loving face again. The outbursts of grief are fearful and at times unbearable. As she wrote these loving words, Victoria was rewriting her own history. Since her teens, she'd loathed her mother, the Duchess of Kent. On becoming queen, she'd moved her out of her court and shunned her. They'd barely spoken properly for years. But when her mother died in March 1861, Victoria suddenly realised what she'd lost. As most children do when their parents are dying, Victoria sorted through her mother's effects. Amongst them, small pink love notes written to Victoria when she was a young girl and placed under her pillow. My dearest, beloved Victoria, let me say a few words to you before you shut your dear little eyes. In some hours, this year is closed. Let us thank the great and almighty God for all the many blessings we experienced this year. Well, you can imagine with what shock Victoria read these letters in grown-up life after her mother had died. Since she and her mother had become estranged, Victoria had told herself that her mother had been unkind, that she'd had an unhappy childhood. And here was visible, tangible evidence that her mother had adored her and that there had been many periods of joy in her childhood. She had the letters bound up in this magnificent leather volume and pricked out on the cover the words, from dear mama. She was born in May 1819 at Kensington Palace, but it might as well have been in Germany. Her mother was German, Princess Victoria of saxe saalfeld She barely spoke English, she was the widow of Prince Charles of Leiningen. Victoria's father was her second husband, the Duke of Kent, but he was to die just eight months after Victoria arrived. That she never knew her father was arguably the single most important factor in Victoria's psychology. The Queen would spend her life searching for a father figure. Widowed a second time, the Duchess of Kent was by royal standards impoverished. 
Her brother-in-law, King William IV, allowed her to carry on roughing it rent-free here at Kensington Palace, where she fell prey to the ambitious John Conroy. Historian Kate Williams has chronicled events at Kensington Palace. She really needed someone to depend on, and Conroy stepped in, he saw the vacuum really, stepped in and made it his own, and really pretty much made himself almost king. For little Victoria, looking for a kindly man to play papa, Schema Conroy was a disaster. In diaries written in adulthood, she paints him as a sort of pantomime villain, and her childhood as miserable. I led a very unhappy life as a child. Had no brothers and sisters, never had a father, was not on comfortable or at all intimate or confidential footing with my mother. These words, written when she was a grown-up, paint a pretty bleak picture. But the truth was more nuanced. Yes, she was a poor fatherless girl who for the rest of her life craved male attention. Yes, Sir John Conroy was a bully and a cad. Yes, the Duchess of Kent was a silly goose. And between them, the Duchess and John Conroy devised something they called the Kensington system. It meant total separation from the court. And here, in Kensington Palace, it meant that the child was never alone. She shared a bedroom with her mother. She never ate anything which hadn't been tasted first. She wasn't allowed on this staircase unless she was accompanied. The Kensington system was really a way in which the Duchess of Kent and John Conroy, in particular Conroy, wanted to control Victoria. And this vision that she would come to the throne at 12, 13, and they'd be in charge. And Conroy, presumably, was the chief agent of this system. The Duchess of Kent was a woman who really was out of her depth. She was out of her depth in Britain. She knew the royal family hated her. She couldn't really speak English. When Conroy came along, he said, you know, I can see an opportunity here. And so Victoria, this tiny, plump little child, this really little toddler, she's everyone's passport to glory, to riches, to massive grandeur. It was a repressive regime. But while Victoria's diaries recall a lonely childhood, we must remember she was prone to reinterpreting her own story. Deirdre Murphy is curator of the Victoria Revealed exhibition at Kensington Palace. So this is the room that Princess Victoria was supposedly born in. Oh, she was born here? Yeah. Yes, she was born in this room. One of her dolls' houses? Yes, from the late 1820s. And she had lots of dolls? She had lots of dolls. She made them herself with her governess, Baroness Leitzen, and together had lots of fun dressing them. There were animals. She had a beautiful looking Charles Spaniel named Dash. She would play with him in the gardens and every now and then would dress him up in costumes. <laughs> she did have quite a happy childhood when she looked back on it. She saw it as unhappy. And I wonder whether you think, in fact, it was the bullying of Conroy when she was a teenager that led her to have this view. I completely agree with that. These memories that she brings back throughout her life later on are not necessarily reliable because she changes her view from time to time. So in, in 1872, her eldest daughter Vicky is marrying and having children. She writes to Vicky about how difficult her childhood was, giving her advice about how to treat her own children. And this is a theme that marks through her letters and correspondence but we clearly can't rely on that completely because she clearly had fun here, she was indulged, and had a pretty good deal, actually. At half past six, we went to the play to Drury Lane. It was Shakespeare's tragedy of King John. The principal characters were King John and Mr. McCready, who acted beautifully. We came to the very beginning and stayed to the very end. I was very much amused. Her mother and Leitzen and Victoria were stage struck and they often came here to the glitzy London West End. The Theatre Royal Drury Lane was one of their favourites, to the play, to the opera, to the ballet. You and I, to give ourselves a treat, might go to the opera or the ballet two or three times a year. Victoria, as a teenager, went to the opera two or three times a week. Victoria's family ruled in turbulent times. Her uncle, King William IV, 
was the last monarch to appoint his own Prime Minister in defiance of Parliament. The people demanded changes to the corrupt electoral system, and sweeping reforms in 1832 did little to dispel the scent of revolution in the air. Trapped in Kensington Palace, Princess Victoria was ignorant of it all. What Victoria did come to realize, however, was the future that awaited her. There were no other legitimate heirs to the throne. This young girl, three quarters German, was next in line. And didn't Conroy and the court know it? They knew that whoever influenced this child influenced the future British head of state. Which is why, when she was 13, Conroy and her mother took Princess Victoria on a tour across the country. They sensed that if the monarchy were to survive, it must be more visible. Free from the claustrophobic atmosphere of Kensington, Victoria found herself exposed to the world outside, a world of industrial change and burgeoning unrest. Instead of the safety of the nursery with her dolls, she found herself looking into the faces of the poor, grimy with smoke and soot. And she wrote about her experiences in her journal, given and read by her mother. We have just passed through a town where all coal mines are, and you see the fire glimmer at a distance in the engines in many places. The men, women, children, country and houses are all black. Professor Jane Ridley has written A Life of the Queen. It's quite interesting. Uh, she was sent on those tours which she rather hated around England. And the pressure she was under, I think, is quite extreme. I think it might account for why she actually hated appearing in public later on in life. I think her mother saw keeping a journal as part of the training of being a monarch. It's fascinating. So it was, in a sense, part of the Kensington system, the journal? I would say it was. I saw a diary of somebody who was at one of these things in Plymouth. And this person noticed that at dinner, uh, the little princess didn't say anything. She just looked round the table all the time. She kept looking, looking. And they asked afterwards, you know, what's wrong with this child? Why, did she, why was she looking at all the people? Uh, and Conroy said, she's been trained to remember who they are. Uh, and when she gets back, she'll be tested on them by her mother. And if you look at the entry in the diary, you see a long, long list of names, none of whom she could have known, none of which could have made any sense to her at all. It's hard to say exactly when, but by her early teens, the princess had come to see what her mother and Conroy were up to. Victoria was coming to realize her position as a pawn in the political power game. And she came to feel that her mother was siding with Sir John Conroy against her. Things came to a head here in the seaside town of Ramsgate on a fateful day in autumn 1835, when her hatred of Conroy was confirmed and she came to loathe her mother. It was after a tour of the north. Victoria was exhausted and sickly when they arrived here at the Albion Hotel. She had a very sore throat and she became ill. The doctor came, the doctor went, said she was all right. Her mother refused to believe her, thought she was just making a fuss. Conroy said she was shamming. So this goes on for several days, Victoria getting quite dangerously ill. Where artisans are now creating a new bijou hotel, Victoria lay in her bed at a low ebb. John Conroy seized his opportunity. He clumsily barged into her bedroom and tried to make her sign away her future powers as queen. His idea was to have a regency, with the Duchess of Kent ruling in Victoria's stead and, of course, John Conroy ruling the Duchess. Sick as she was, the 16-year-old, backed up by her governess, Louise Leitzen, refused Conroy. It would seem that Sir John was all but violent with her. I resisted in spite of my illness and their harshness, my beloved Leitzen supporting me alone. From now on, Victoria was just waiting to be 18 and rid of the influence of Conroy and her mother. She began to forget her happy childhood and dwell only on the sad things. The experience at Ramsgate had poisoned her childhood memory and fueled her resentment against her mother. The myth of the totally unhappy childhood was born. 
But Victoria was also possessed of a sense of destiny. She knew that Uncle William wasn't going to be alive for much longer. The king had fathered 12 children, but no living legitimate heir. In June 1837, he died in his sleep of a heart attack. Her mother woke Victoria. I got out of bed and went into my sitting room, only in my dressing gown, alone, and saw them. Kneeling before her, the Archbishop of Canterbury and the Lord Chamberlain were now her subjects. Victoria, more German than British, was now queen. She was ready to throw herself into the role. The survival of the monarchy itself depended on her success. I am very young, and perhaps in many, though not in all things inexperienced, but I am sure that very few have more real goodwill and more desire to do what is fit and right than I have. Victoria was now free of the Kensington system and all it represented. But she was just 18 years old, and she needed help to be head of state. Luckily, help was at hand in the form of somebody who himself needed human companionship. Her aristocratic Whig Prime Minister, Lord Melbourne. Cometh the time, cometh the father figure. Melbourne was everything that Conroy wasn't. He was loving, kind, and emotionally intelligent. He saw what she needed, and he lavished it on her. In her diary, Queen Victoria had described herself as the little fatherless girl. Now the 58-year-old Prime Minister made sure she felt in control, but safe in his care. It was he who prepared Victoria and who stage-managed the momentous coronation here at Westminster Abbey in June 1838. Since 1066, almost every English monarch has been crowned here. Victoria had been raised to be ready for this pivotal moment in her own life and that of the nation since her birth. There was a two-day fair in the park. There were illuminations. There was a firework display. There were people swarming into central London to see their new queen. She was woken at 4 a.m. by the booming of the guns in the park. And yet, she doesn't mention her mother once when she came to write it up in her journal. The central figure for Victoria on her coronation day was Lord M. My excellent Lord Melbourne, who stood very close to me throughout the whole ceremony, was completely overcome at this moment and very much affected. He gave me such a kind and, may I say, fatherly look. First things first, Victoria wanted to get rid of Sir John Conroy. Conroy realised that his luck had run out. He wanted to cash in his chips. He claimed that Victoria had privately offered him a huge pension of £3,000 a year and an English peerage. Well, Melbourne wasn't having any of that, though he did offer Conroy an Irish peerage, which was refused. The influence of Conroy was now decisively over. There is no end to the amusing anecdotes and stories Lord Melbourne tells, and he tells them all in such an amusing and funny way. The passionate friendship which sprang up between them gave to the young queen the security she craved, and to Melbourne, reeling from a shattered marriage, someone to care for. Really, every day he was with us, sometimes for five hours a day, they'd ride together, they'd do jigsaws together, they'd play cards together. He participated in all of this. And through this constant being by the Queen's side, he gained a lot of influence, a lot of power, and essentially, he could really tell her what her role was. So what he had was something people envied incredibly. Her education started here. The journals bubble with her conversations with Lord M. They talked of everything under the sun, from French history to Shakespeare, from mixed-race marriages to Whig society gossip. 
It wasn't just a political process that Lord M introduced her to, it was life itself. Her relationship with Melbourne was helped along by a charming weakness on the part of the Queen. She always fell for men who made her laugh. The flirty, fun-loving teenage Queen leaps from her pages. I asked Lord M how he liked my dress. He said he thought it very pretty and that it did very well. Talked to my having taken a bath, his seldom doing so. Talked to my having wished to roll in the grass when I was in the garden, which made him laugh. As a young man, he had been outstandingly good looking, and he still is. He was incredibly charming. He knew everybody. He takes upon himself not just to sort of educate the young queen, but also to act in effect as her private secretary. Her journals during the Melbourne years are fascinating because she wrote down absolutely everything that he said. Melbourne, more than anybody, is making her a British queen. Politically speaking, the relationship between Queen Victoria and Lord Melbourne had no significance whatsoever. Lord M was absolutely out of sympathy with his own times. And while the pair were out together laughing and riding, the country was in a state of unease. Great riots had broke out at Birmingham again. Houses burned and others plundered, which he, Lord M, feared was to be expected. Melbourne protected Victoria, but the national movement for working-class emancipation that produced the People's Charter couldn't be ignored. There was trouble with the sugar trade. And then, in 1839, a parliamentary defeat over Irish independence forced Melbourne to resign. She'd felt safe, secure and much loved. Now she felt alone, exposed. It was almost as though he died. All my happiness gone. That happy, peaceful life destroyed. That dearest, kind Lord Melbourne. No more my minister. The Prime Minister's replacement was the Tory Sir Robert Peel. He had no charm, no sense of humour, and he couldn't flirt. Lord M's charm had given him power over Victoria. Peel's lack of it almost guaranteed a battle of wills. Their first meeting sparked a constitutional crisis. Peel almost immediately said, you've got to change your ladies. The ladies of the robes, the ladies of the bedchamber, they want a wigs, they now have to be Tories. And Victoria, she couldn't cope with this. She said to Peel, I'm not changing my ladies. I am not doing this. Peel surprised her by saying, in that case, he wouldn't be her prime minister. It became known as the bedchamber crisis. Robert Peel was a very astute politician. By refusing to be prime minister, he demonstrated quite a lot of things to the world at large. He demonstrated that Victoria was a Whig partisan. He'd also demonstrated that she was trying to exercise the kind of monarchical power which no longer existed in Britain. This was the last time the British monarch ever openly defied a, a represented politician. Victoria felt victorious, but her intransigence pointed up her immaturity. That she'd put her own selfish needs before those of Parliament was visible to all, and the ramifications were immense. Peel's refusal to serve created a vacuum. Melbourne was forced to return as Prime Minister of a weak Whig government, which lasted just two more years. The political system had been shaken by a young girl's tantrum, the sort of behaviour a more enlightened mother might have influenced if she'd been more present in Victoria's life. The Duchess was now very much behind the scenes, but she was nevertheless quietly engineering her daughter's future and her own. The question on everybody's lips was, who was the young queen going to marry? And broadly speaking, there were three options. She could have married her cousin in England, George, Duke of Cambridge, who was a soldier her age. They were fast friends throughout their lives, but George used to say rather ungallantly he'd never wanted to marry plain little Victoria. Old William IV had wanted her to marry into the Dutch royal family, but Victoria was having none of that. The two eligible princes of Orange were frightful oafs. And then there was the third option, favoured by Uncle Leopold, King of the Belgians, and by her mother, and that was that she should forge a political alliance with her co cousin, Prince Albert. 
Since 1714, the English Hanoverian royal family had been German. Victoria was by descent a member of this family, but her mother was of a different line, the saxe coburg Grotus, and so was Albert. They saw in this marriage a chance for the family effectively to take over the running of Great Britain. They had met before as teenagers. 17-year-old Albert and his brother Ernest had encountered Victoria at a family get-together in England. Ernest was taller and funnier. Dr. Karina Orbach is a biographer of Queen Victoria. The first time he came over with, uh, with his brother Ernest, she thought that Ernest was the more interesting one because that was the lively one and the, the fun-loving one. But when they met the second time round, um, then of course he, he had become a quite good-looking man and it was a very a hormonal decision for her to marry him. In autumn 1839, the bright-eyed prince, now 20, came for a visit from Germany. And Victoria, three months older, nearly a foot shorter, was completely smitten by him. Albert really is quite charming and so excessively handsome. Such beautiful blue eyes and exquisite nose and such a pretty mouth with delicate moustaches and slight but very slight whiskers. A beautiful figure, broad in the shoulders and a fine waist. My heart is quite going. Knowing with hindsight how much rested on that meeting, it's hard not to feel a little awestruck by the innocence of Victoria's emotions when she first set eyes on the youthful Albert. They were destined to become the grandparents of Europe, one of the most famous couples in history. But the path ahead was not going to be an easy one. Victoria was extremely vulnerable emotionally. She was also the most eligible princess in Europe in the world. As she swooned, she unconsciously fell in with plans laid by a grand master of political manoeuvring, Prince Albert's equivalent of Lord Melbourne. This was never intended to be a love match. Of course Albert was going to support his wife, but he wanted to influence her politically. Guided himself by his own political mentor, Freiherr Dr. Stockmar of Coburg, they wanted to establish constitutional monarchy as the principal bulwark against revolution in Europe. And the best way of doing that was to marry the British Queen and have a large family. So Albert took this marriage on as a challenge. And he knew it would be tough because that's what Stockmar told him when he was about to go to England the second time. He said, do you want to do this? This is going to be a hard life, you know, you will have to um, help this, this woman in distress. That's how he sold Victoria. Albert was a controller and a cold fish, but from the first, they were passionately and physically in love. Dearest Albert took my face in both his hands and kissed me most tenderly and said, Ich habe dich so lieb. Ich kann nicht sagen wie. I love you so much. I cannot say how much. She was so besotted by Albert, by his beauty and talent, how he could play the piano, dance, and talk about her favorite opera, that she hardly realized how much of her own freedom and personality she was surrendering when she asked him to marry her. And marry they did. We both went to bed, of course in one bed, to lie by his side and in his arms and on his dear bosom and be called names of tenderness I have never yet heard used to me before. Ah, oh, this was the happiest day of my life. There's no doubt that there was a strong sexual attraction. I think so, yes, yes, definitely. When one reads her diaries, one is um, impressed by her um, openness. I mean, she, she really says how beautiful he was and how wonderful it is to be touched by him and things like and that. And after so. they got married, she enjoyed him taking off her stockings, putting on her stockings. Yes, having intimacy so for the first time, yes. So she was utterly delighted by him yes. in a physical way. That was lucky. That was lucky. Yeah. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> The Duchess of Kent was not so lucky. Victoria was now no longer a child, 
and felt able to flex her muscles for all to see. She shunned her mother. The Duchess of Kent was a woman destroyed. She couldn't believe that Victoria didn't want to see her. Victoria wanted to get away from her mother at every opportunity, and the whole court saw this. Victoria confided in her journal her ongoing coldness to her mother. It has been observed that after the marriage, I kissed the Queen Mother and only shook hands with Mama, which I said was true. It's heartrending to read the cry of the rejected mother seeking the approval of the callous daughter. In the year after Victoria married, her mother wrote to her, Oh, Victoria, why are you so cold and indifferent with your mother, who loves you so dearly? But the Queen had eyes for Albert and Albert alone. He appeared to be her dream come true. Victoria was in raptures. Her mother, who'd planned the whole thing, was sidelined. Victoria took a lease of £2,000 a year on this house, 36 Belgrave Square, and she dumped her mother in it. It's handy for the palace. I can see the trees of the Garden of Buckingham Palace from where I'm standing. But the Duchess of Kent was very definitely outside the palace. Here was her place, and her daughter had firmly put her in it. What Victoria wanted now was solitude, romance, and excitement in company of her man and Superman, Prince Albert. They fled to the most romantic part of the British Isles and furthest from the London court. Soulful Albert was already homesick, and the landscape and even the people reminded him of his German homeland. Victoria, too, loved the Highlanders. She enjoyed their lack of deference, how they treated her as if she was a human being. There was a quiet, a retirement, a wilderness, a liberty, and a solitude that had such a charm for us. You can hear the relief in Victoria's words, her joy at being out of London and away from state duties. They both loved the great outdoors, Victoria and Albert. He liked going deer stalking. She was a very good watercolorist and liked to take her sketchbook out onto the hills. Gilly, Sandy Reed, knows the places that made her heart sing. So what were her favorite views when she was around here? Well, I think at one time she just loved to go on her picnics and Tulloch, the hill over on her right there. Uh, that was our favorite picnic spot. She would get on the pony, uh, ride side saddle up the hill, and Albert, would, he would go off stalking, and uh, she would just wait, and her, they would have a picnic waiting for him coming back again. Have you heard whether Prince Albert was a good shot or not? Uh, well, I don't think he was really a good shot, like, you know, but... Was he uh, not? <laughs> <laughs> he always seemed to have uh, what you would call hard luck. In the evenings, they would retire to the homes of the Scottish nobility for whiskey and flings. I danced several quadrilles and valses, finishing up with a galop with Albert. Ah, oh, the innocence of young love, but they were in for an extraordinary journey together. Neither of them wanted to surrender their independence. Both wanted power, and more than is the case in most marriages, there were to be some furious clashes of wills. Initially, Albert thought he'd won because Victoria said she'd obey him in the marriage ceremony, but that was just for show. Victoria saw Albert as a helper. Nothing better in her vision. She was writing letters and Albert was getting the blotting paper. That was his role. He wanted to be king. He wanted to have power. Albert wanted control, and all he had to do was to let nature take its course. Within a month of the wedding, Victoria was pregnant. And when she first fell pregnant, she was pretty miserable. She just thought, this has happened so quickly. And she wrote to Uncle Leopold, who was thrilled and so excited, said, I, if I have a nasty girl at the end of all my trials, I'll drown it. Victoria was conflicted. She adored Albert and he wanted more children, 
But with every pregnancy, she had to give him more executive power, and he hadn't reckoned on her fury. After she gave birth to the Princess Royal, Vicky, she suffered from terrible postnatal depression, and there was a most awful row with Prince Albert. There is often an irritability in me, she wrote, which makes me say cross and odious things which I don't myself believe and which I fear hurt Albert. Albert just couldn't cope with the swings of emotion and with the rows. And he wrote in despair to old Dr. Stockmar, who was both a medical doctor as well as his political advisor, for advice. Victoria is too hasty and passionate for me to be able often to speak of my difficulties. She will not hear me out, but flies into a rage and overwhelms me with reproaches of suspiciousness, want of trust, ambition, envy. She was at once furious and adoring. She missed the brief but golden period when Albert was hers alone. She was jealous of the children on whom he lavished his attention. She hated being pregnant and she hated, she, was, she wasn't enjoying any of the children. That, that's really sad. I mean, in, in, in his letters, he, he keeps saying, why do you always nag them? Why do, can't you be kind to them? And um, she, ha she didn't have many motherly feelings because she was so obsessed with her husband. Victoria was in a very difficult position. On the one hand, she was the Queen of England. On the other, she was a young married woman who simply couldn't stop losing her temper, and sometimes the rages amounted to almost madness. She was married to a cold-hearted control freak who punished her when she lost her temper. This made her feel even more inadequate, but how she strove to improve herself. Locked away in Windsor Castle, are the most fascinating of the Queen's diaries, written later in her marriage. They were Victoria's secret, and they demonstrate how Albert had her in an emotional flux, by turns angry, elated, even self-flagellating. This volume is called Remarks, Conversations, Reflections. And here's what she writes on her wedding anniversary, February the 10th. What cause have I ever for gratitude, and yet, alas, how often, and even to my distress on this holy day, does my foolish susceptibility and irritability cause me misery for moments and annoyance to that most perfect and unselfish of human beings, my adored husband. She confides all these pathetic feelings about how unworthy she is and how, how she can't control herself. And, 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 and you get the feeling that this woman has been made to feel that she is sort of inadequate uh, in this relationship. How much do you think Albert controlled her? I think it was a controlling relationship. Victoria endlessly trying to improve herself and to impress Albert, Albert with her um, success in, in, in making herself a, a better person. You get the impression that at the end of every year, Victoria has a sort of a moral account system, if you like. She doesn't, you know, we do our accounts, Victoria did her moral accounts. Albert was succeeding where Sir John Conroy had failed, acquiring executive power by stealth. His design was grand. He wanted to change the course of history, and the children were his weapons. Creating more and more of them was part of a master plan devised with Baron Stockmar for the security of England and Europe. Albert knew that for a ruling monarch there was no such thing as a private life. The birth of each and every one of his children made a political statement. Europe was moving in a republican direction. Albert was determined to reverse this trend by making those children European kings and queens. Albert didn't want to be thought of as the young man from Coburg, meekly fitting into the traditions of the English royal house. He needed to be seen as a political force, and he looked for a powerful physical manifestation of his presence. Which is why, in 1845, he acquired this estate, Osborne, 
on the Isle of Wight, overlooking the Solent, in one of the most idyllic spots in southern England. It was to be his project. He designed it, he made it. Osborne was to be the embodiment of Prince Albert's ideals of family life, ideals which Queen Victoria herself enthusiastically endorsed. It is impossible to imagine a prettier spot. We have a charming beach quite to ourselves. We can walk anywhere without being followed or mobbed. You might think you are entering the palace of an Italian Renaissance prince, of the kind that Prince Albert visited when he was a teenager. But in a way you are, only it's the palace of a modern Renaissance prince. The architectural design was Albert's, as was the original interior decor. Every artwork and sculpture steeped in Enlightenment ideals. It was originally minimalist. The later knick-knackery and clutter is all Victoria. When they first came here, she already had three small children, so she happily let him take a lead in matters aesthetic. But as the family grew, so did his ambition. These desks in Queen Victoria's sitting room are a symbolic reminder of how much she came to depend upon her husband. One for Albert, one for her. Actually, it was Albert who did most of the day-to-day -day work of the head of state, signing documents, reading cabinet papers, and so forth. While Victoria gave birth to nine babies, Albert drew more and more political power to himself. For a decade, Victoria saw Albert through a thick hormonal fog. Sometimes her resolve slipped. I am every day more convinced that we women, if we are to be good women, feminine and amiable and domestic, are not fitted to reign. The other great Victorian diarist, Charles Greville, noted that whilst Victoria had the title, after a few years of marriage, Albert was king to all intents and purposes. The royal family life was tellingly immortalized in oils by the German artist Winterhalter. When this picture was first exhibited at the Royal Academy in 1847, it was very much criticized. They thought the Queen of England lacked decorum. She was showing so much bare flesh. Her husband is extending a sexy finger into wifey's moist little palm. But what I think so interesting about this picture is that although Queen Victoria is wearing her coronet, it is Albert who is centre stage. It's a picture of familial contentment, but also of Albert's success. By now he'd achieved what he left Germany to do. Perhaps his greatest success was Princess Vicky. Whatever happened to Albert in the future, she would carry on his work, perhaps even control her mother. The Princess Royal was every inch Prince Albert's daughter. There was a tremendous kinship between Vicky and Albert. And obviously the Queen felt a little bit envious of this. But there was pride too. The family had visited Blair Castle back in 1844 when they first set eyes on an estate up in the north at Balmoral. Her mother wrote of her happiness at the toddler's maturity. Albert walked up the steps with me, I holding his arm and Vicky his hand, amid the loud cheers of the people, all the way to the carriage, our dear Vicky behaving like a grown-up person, not put out, nor frightened, nor nervous. Eleven years later, now aged 14, Vicky was back here with the family in the landscape of the Highlands that so reminded her father, the Prince Consort, of the dear German Heimat. But this was to be no ordinary family holiday of sketching and stalking. Victoria and Albert had long planned to marry each of their children off to different European royal houses in a series of political alliances, and this the first such political scheme 
was much the most significant. The Queen had vilified her manipulating mother, but the master plan she and Albert had for Wittes was every bit as Machiavellian. She and Friedrich Wilhelm, Crown Prince of Prussia known as Fritz, were mere pawns. Victoria put the would-be lovers in the most romantic of settings, a place she and Albert loved. The Queen knew the effect these surroundings could have on sensitive youth. The possibilities had her all a flutter. Fritz looks very well, altogether looking more manly, and his moustache becomes him. The visit makes my heart beat as it may, and probably will decide the fate of our dear eldest child. He was 23. She was 14, little more than a child, in her sprigged white muslin dress trimmed with red ribbons. But it was the start of a romance. They walked on the slopes of Craig Naban. He picked her a sprig of white heather, and there they had their first kiss. The plan had worked. Vicky loved Fritz, and that night ran into her mother's room to tell her. Having engineered the whole thing, Victoria, conflicted as ever, now tried to take control, insisting Vicky delay marriage until she was 17. Queen Victoria felt the classic envy that mothers so often feel for daughters when they emerge from childhood into womanhood, especially if the daughters have been very close to the father. She complained of Vicky's waywardness of temper, sharp answers and lack of self-control, a pretty ripe case, you might imagine, of the pot calling the kettle black. And as the wedding day approached, Queen Victoria felt all the usual cluster of emotions. She will no longer be an innocent girl, but a wife, and perhaps this time next year already a mother. They were married in January 1858. Then the newlyweds left for Prussia. Thus began one of the most remarkable correspondences in history, in which a monarch of one country tried to control the behavior of a crown princess of another by post. The Queen Victoria does write lots of admonishing letters, you know, she, she doesn't want to let go. <laughs> it's very funny in some ways, then, that Victoria thought she could still control the way she behaved at court, whether she was sitting down, standing up. I mean, even the tiniest details. It's ridiculous, yeah. To I mean, the point where the, the, the German authorities actually wrote back to London saying, can the Queen please stop bombarding the Crown Princess with all these terrible letters? When Vicky wrote that Fritz was to be a father, things came to a head. Most mothers at least pretend to be pleased at the prospect of becoming a grandmother. But when Vicky became pregnant, this was not the case. Having her nine children had placed great psychological strain, both on Queen Victoria herself and on her marriage. So in her letters to Vicky, we find that she does not hold back. What you say of the pride of giving life to an immortal soul is very fine, dear, but I cannot enter into that. I think much more of our being like a cow or a dog at such moments, when our poor nature becomes so very animal and unecstatic. But for you, dear, if you're sensible and reasonable, not in ecstasy, nor spending your day with nurses and wet nurses, which is the ruin of many a refined and intellectual young lady. The Queen was half of the most famous couple of the age, in her letters to Vicky, she reveals her ambivalence about marriage, tells truths that Princess Beatrice would surely have redacted had she got her hands on them, but she didn't. They stayed behind in Germany, and they are the business, because with these letters, you see her unmasked. There is a stream of consciousness pouring out of her two or three times a week to her daughter in Germany, uh, about everything under the sun, about the unsatisfactoriness of men and of marriage, all marriage is such a lottery. The happiness is always an exchange, though it may be a very happy one. Still, the poor woman is bodily and morally the husband's slave. That always sticks in my throat. She must have found writing in this way so very cathartic. 
The Queen's relationships with all her children, the jealousies, the criticism, show how pivotally she was affected by the tensions and pressures of her first formative years with her own mother. She'd never addressed that relationship, and in 1861, she ran out of time. Ever since Victoria married and had babies, her own mother had been an exemplary grandmother. Not a child's birthday got forgotten, not an anniversary overlooked. But since Conroy had been totally banished at the beginning of the reign, the poor Duchess of Kent lived in everlasting dread that she herself would one day be spurned. Victoria had convinced herself that it was her mother's heavy-handed parenting that had sundered the bond between them. But she was devastated when she learned that her mother was dying of cancer. I think it came like a thunderbolt upon us, and I think I never suffered as I did during those four dreadful hours till we heard she was better. I hardly knew myself how I loved her or how my whole existence seemed bound up with her. For decades, they'd barely spoken. Victoria had written the story of her terrible parenting, and now she was rewriting it all in despair. I can't bear to think of all you have to go through. If only I could be near you and see you very often and long to beguile away the dull hours when you can't amuse yourself. But it was too little, too late. The Duchess didn't live to see Easter. Victoria threw herself on Albert, little knowing that this terrible year would be their last together. Albert himself was a sick man. They now seem to think he had Crohn's disease, or possibly abdominal cancer, or possibly both. And he died that same year, 1861, in December. Victoria was just 42 years old. She'd spent her life struggling against an oppressive childhood and against the tedium of motherhood. But however difficult her marriage had been, she had now grown totally dependent upon Albert. Writing to her uncle Leopold, she cried out, The poor fatherless baby is now utterly broken-hearted and crushed widow of 42. Victoria was often on the brink of instability. Now, grief precipitated a mental crisis that had some advisers wondering if she'd inherited the famous Hanoverian madness. It must be said that mourning became her, drama queen that she was. 1861 was her annus horribilis, her darkest hour. She ended it as an orphan and a widow. And it would be the making of her. The widow of Windsor, as she would come to be known, was no longer in the shadow of her brilliant puritanical angel, Albert. So there will be another story to be told. And it's a story of liberation from him, in which Victoria found herself alone, able along the journey to make some most unlikely friendships as she became her own woman. Next time, his life was over, but her life wasn't over. In Widow's Weeds, Victoria is anything but retiring. Her writings reveal a queen quite different to the icon we thought we knew. Freed from Albert, she becomes a politician, a diplomat, and perhaps a lover. Woman, what are you doing? The most powerful monarch on earth is a woman unchained. Is there a feeling, Dr. Reed, knew the na nature of the relationship? Yes. And on the verge of a nervous breakdown. In 1897, Victoria's Diamond Jubilee celebrations were the expression of supreme confidence. She was Queen of Great Britain. She was Empress of India. Her empire, in fact, stretched all over the world. What made the event so remarkable wasn't just the fact that the streets of London were thronged with thousands of people singing God Save the Queen, as that the 78-year-old monarch was prepared to be seen in public at all. The widow of Windsor, as she was known, struggled with public appearances because she was shy. 
but also because she was still ostensibly in mourning. For 36 years, she'd been the embodiment of grief. But appearances are deceptive. Behind this well-known image of Victoria lies another story to that of the heartbroken widow. It was only part of the truth about Victoria, whose marriage had been a source of constraint, as well as deep love. The loss of her beloved husband and of her mother was a terrible blow, but it also initiated a process of liberation for a woman who'd spent her entire life under the shadow of domineering men. Victoria had been a pawn in a political game as a child and young queen. Her angel, Prince Albert, had used her pregnancies as a way to gain power and punished her for resenting it. But in her widowhood, Victoria, although bereft and deranged, was free to embark on a way of life and on loves that were to make her last four decades her most productive and exciting. And luckily for us, she committed all her feelings to paper. She wrote more than 50 million words. Some were judged so shocking by her children that when she died, they were destroyed. I've spent the last five years reading Queen Victoria's journals and unpublished letters. And I've come to feel something almost approaching awe for her. Behind that stout old lady in black sitting at her writing table was a passionate human being. And contrary to what is so often said, she was frequently and easily amused. In 1861 was Queen Victoria's Annus Horribilis. The deaths of her mother and her husband left her distraught. She fled London. It was presumed that her absence from the capital meant she was doing nothing, left inept by grief. In her journal, she bewailed the loss of her lover, her friend, her crutch. He did everything, everywhere. Nothing did I do without him, from the greatest to the smallest. My first word was, I must ask Albert. In her delirium, she turned the man she'd often resented and fought with into a demigod. What Victoria didn't realize at 42 years old was that marriage had infantilized her. Marriage does infantilize people. She'd come to rely on Albert for absolutely everything. She don't see him first thing in the morning and say, what dress should I put on? In politics and in personal life, he had restrained her and controlled her. And now his life was over, but her life wasn't over. Little by little, she would flap her wings and become free. And her first small steps to freedom were taken here in Coburg, in modern-day Germany, her homeland and the birthplace of Albert and her mother. She confessed her ongoing love affair with Germany in her journal. If I were not who I am, my real home would be here. Victoria was three quarters German. She idolized the land and the people. The very air smelled like Albert and she breathed it in. When she started coming back to Coburg, her brother-in-law, Ernst, Albert's brother, expected her to stay with him in his grand Baroque palace in the middle of town, Schloss Ehrenberg. But she preferred to be here, in Schloss Rosenau, beautiful hunting lodge about five miles out of town, where Albert was born. It's a place full of his childhood memories, surrounded by quietness, by the hills and the forests, Inconsolably bereaved, she certainly was. And you can see here a page from the visitor's book she wrote in 1862, Victoria Regina, the desolate widow of my beloved Albert. A direct descendant of Prince Albert keeps the line alive today in the nearby Schloss Kallenberg, Hubertus is the hereditary prince of Saxe Coburg and Gotha. So let's enter the treasure house. One of the rooms here, please. Oh, wonderful. Thank you very much. 
You, sir, are the great, great, great grandson of yes, Prince Albert. Yes, that is correct. This is where we show the family relationships between the sex coburg gotha family and the British. Oh, look, that's a marvelous Winterhouse. Yes, Prince Albert of sex coburg and gotha so that's after he's arrived in Britain. Yeah, yeah, it was in the early uh, 1840s. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> well, he went bald. Oh, and look at this beautiful painting. She didn't dress very well, but she had stupendous jewels. <laughs> That's what the French noticed, didn't they, when she went to Paris? Yes. After she was widowed, she became even more yes. attached to Germany, even more conscious of her German roots, didn't she? And Coburg was a particularly yeah. special well, place. Queen Victoria's roots are in, indeed very German. She was definitely fluent in the German language. And even after the too early death of Prince Albert, she still uh, was, was very much in love with uh, Germany and, and especially Coburg. And uh, she came back to open up a monument for Albert here in 1865 on the marketplace. That was also one of the very few public appearances, apparently, that she did after his death. Oh, yes. Victoria had always loved melodrama since her days as a young queen. And now, in her mourning, she made her loss blindingly clear to see, ever dressed in black. She desired everyone to enter into her grief. Dr. Karina Orbach, an expert in Anglo-German relations, sheds light on Victoria's behavior after Albert's death. She's such a bad psychologist because Albert told her, don't overdo it, please, when, when I'm gone. And she does exactly the opposite. She puts him on this pedestal. She drags her children into the, the room once a year, the room he died in. She uh, keeps preaching him all the time how wonderful he was. And it is absolutely ridiculous because the children, of course, hate it after a while and resent um, everything about this um, idealized father. So it achieves the absolute opposite. She went back again and again and again to Coburg. Yes, I think she would have loved to live just in a little cottage in, in Germany with Albert. That was her ideal. And it was home. It was the Heimat, wasn't it? Yes. She feels relaxed because when, when she talks German, she can be a different person. In her English identity, she has to be the queen. In Germany, she's just a kleine Frau, as Albert calls her. <laughs> Grief-stricken Victoria may have been, but inept she certainly wasn't. She was about to demonstrate her political astuteness in Germany, then not a unified country as we know it today. Germany was merely a notion. The question was, would the various small German duchies and city-states come together in a peaceful federation, or would they allow themselves to be bullied by the Northern Kingdom of Prussia into becoming a modern militaristic nation? That was the central political drama of Victoria's times. And in that drama, she stood plumb center stage. In the summer of 1863, the queen came here to Schloss Ehrenberg. While she was here, she thrust herself between the twin camps of Prussia and Austria before any of her diplomats. It was her first major activity since she was widowed felt so nervous, all being in state, and I alone. I have no longer my beloved Albert to guide, cheer, advise, and pilot me through the great difficulty. Here, in the Hall of Giants, where Victoria's parents were married, we meet Victoria the diplomat, meeting with no less a person than the Emperor of Austria, and together they drank a toast to the unity of Germany. So early in her widowhood, we find Victoria alone, but nonetheless an independent woman, negotiating, not particularly on behalf of England, but on behalf of a peaceful Europe. Victoria had found the inner strength to exert her power and carry out Albert's political work on her own. In this instance, she's a sort of arbiter. She wants to bring together these um, two Germans, there's Emperor of Austria and then William of Prussia. And, and she thinks that um, there should be some rapprochement or some understanding between the two. She, um, she still hopes for a peaceful solution of the German question. I mean, during that period, if you'd asked many English newspaper editors, 
what's the Queen doing? They'd have said she's drawn to sleep, she's drawn into hiding, she's not doing anything. Yeah. As a matter of fact, she was deeply politically engaged in Germany. Yes, I, I think that's when one underestimates her because she's hiding in black and, and one doesn't understand that she had her back channels and she was very much into this back channel work. And um, she saw herself, because of Albert, as, um, well, a, a diplomat in many ways. It's interesting at this time that we see the British Queen becoming, partly through her own marriage and the marriages of her children, so intimately involved in European politics. At this time, the British politicians complained that their monarch was too weepy, too reclusive, not doing her work, not interested in the main political questions. But Victoria was looking at the future of Europe itself. That seems to me far less parochial, far less narrow than the things that many of her cabinet ministers wanted. And her role in all this was pivotal. The future of Germany was quite literally being fought out between members of her own family, with her eldest daughter Vicky married to the Crown Prince of Prussia and Bertie married to the Princess of Denmark. Victoria was caught in the middle of the war between these neighboring states. Oh, if Bertie's wife was only a good German and not a Dane. Not as regards the influence of the politics, but as regards the peace and harmony of the family. It is terrible to have the poor boy on the wrong side. The personal was the political for Victoria. Intensely German, she nonetheless felt as all mothers would, grief that her family stood on opposing sides of the political divide. While Victoria showed her fortitude on the world stage, involving herself in European wars of global significance, she was also finding freedom at home in her personal life. As a young woman, she'd always sought father figures, from the flirtatious Lord Melbourne to her angel, Albert. Now she had another man by her side. I feel I have here and always in the house, a good, devoted soul, whose only object and interest is my service. And God knows how much I want so to be taken care of. These are the words the 45-year-old Victoria wrote about Albert's Highland servant, a Mr. John Brown, who was brought down from Balmoral to attend Victoria at Osborne in 1864. I honestly think that if it hadn't been for the Highlands of Scotland and the friendship of John Brown in those 10 years after Prince Albert died, that Queen Victoria would have gone stark, staring mad. She'd always loved it here in Scotland, since her early visits with Albert. And the unaffected character of the Highlanders made such a refreshing change after the stuffiness of Windsor and Buckingham Palace. And so it was that the bearded and kilted John Brown, seven years her junior, became Victoria's next male dependency as closest companion and best friend. Raymond Lamont Brown is the Highland Servants' official biographer. She spent far more time with John Brown than with any other person. Yes. Certainly, with, uh, certainly more than any member of her family. Yes, that's true. He would attend her whenever uh, she needed him. He understood her very well. I think something that her family and her ministers didn't understand, that although she was surrounded by people all the time, she was very lonely. And John Brown said to her quite openly, I think you're just a lonely wee bairn that needs to be brought out of herself. And that's exactly what he did. He sort of pulled her out of her depression. He became a walking encyclopedia of Queen Victoria's likes and dislikes, her neuroses and so on. He devoted his life to her. He never went on holiday and he was always there for her. In some ways, it was an even greater commitment than Albert made himself in his marriage vows. It was, it was a, one of absolute service. Yes, yes. Um, 
Albert, of course, had, had his own agenda of the things that he did. But for John Brown, uh, from dawn to dusk, his agenda was Queen Victoria. Alongside Brown's devotion to the Queen came an abruptness and complete disregard for court etiquette, something which Brown could see that Victoria, contrary to her steely appearance, rather enjoyed. Whilst these qualities of Brown's enraged the household, they were precisely the things that made him the ideal companion for Victoria. Great man that Albert had been, he'd always been sickly and fussy. He didn't share his wife's love of guzzling and drinking. Whereas Brown loved his whiskey. He was often tipsy. He liked pouring whiskey into the Queen's milk and saying, don't stay thirsty. Victoria wouldn't credit what I'm about to say, but Brown released her from Albert. He released her inner capacity for hedonism and fun, and she reveled in it. Cheerio. Victoria found freedom in her friendship with this most unlikely of characters, out riding and laughing in the grounds at Osborne with Brown. Where she had been suppressed in her childhood by the cruel workings of Sir John Conroy and had struggled with an overbearing and scheming husband, she loved Brown's openness and dedication to her and her alone. It is a real comfort, for Brown is devoted to me. So simple, so intelligent, and so unlike an ordinary servant. No one could talk to Victoria as John Brown did. He held her in check. There was once an occasion when a footman came into the room carrying a tray, and the poor boy dropped it. The Queen erupted with rage, said he should be dismissed to the kitchens. But John Brown intervened immediately. Woman, what are ye doing to that poor laddie? Are ye need dropping anything yourself? The footman was reinstated. The straight-talking Scotsman had put the Queen of England in her place. And she enjoyed it. But it wasn't just Brown's frankness she relished. He also filled a deep emotional need in Victoria. On the fourth anniversary of Albert's death, she completely defied convention by bringing Brown to pay his respects at Albert's mausoleum. Her writings that day show just how significant Brown's response was for Victoria. When he came to my room later, he was so much affected. He said in his simple, expressive way, with such a tender look of pity while the tears rolled down his cheeks. I didn't like to see you at Frogmore this morning. I felt for you. But what could I do for you? I could die for you. I don't think anybody could ever have replaced Prince Albert, but she needed some kind of, of male clutch, and John Brown supplied that. What came next showed the contradictory nature of Victoria's character. The woman who shied away from the public decided to share her thoughts with everyone. We tend to think that Diana, Princess of Wales, invented the concept of feel my pain. But Queen Victoria got there before her with her decision to publish extracts of her private diaries. Leaves from the Journal of Our Life in the Highlands. It came out in 1868 and was an instant bestseller. No monarch had ever published a book before. This one was wholly at odds with Victoria the Weeping Widow. The journals chronicle her life of outdoor frivolity. She felt truly elated out in the open Highland landscape, at local dances, and at the annual Highland Games. The games began about three o'clock, she writes. One, throwing the hammer. Two, tossing the caber. Three, putting the stone. A pretty wild sight. But the men looked very cold with nothing but their shirts and kilts on. They ran beautifully. The journals are pretty mild stuff. The remarkable thing about them is that they were published at all. They're nice books. They're bound in green, embossed in gold. 
and pretty soon they'd sold over 100,000 copies. There is one person, however, that might be named as the hero of the book, and that, of course, is John Brown. Her children hardly got a look in and weren't best pleased. But it seemed that Victoria was unaware. Instead, she wrote to her eldest, Vicky, asking for validation of the book. You have never said one word about my poor little Highland book, my only book. I had hoped that you and Fritz would have liked it. The reason Vicky might have been avoiding the subject was that her mother's shameless adoration of Brown was causing a scandal. A scurrilous pamphlet entitled John Brown's Legs appeared in New York. It was dedicated to those extraordinary legs, poor bruised and scratched darlings. Here's the queen looking at a damaged knee. Good heavens, what a knee! Uh, sticking out from the kilt of John Brown. What's so hilarious about this is that while the American was penning this pamphlet, the Queen herself was writing a third volume of Leaves from Our Life in the Highlands, in effect, a biography of John Brown. The court and the politicians were absolutely horrified, and somebody had to be delegated to tell her that the book was entirely inappropriate. They chose the poor young Dean of Windsor, and he went in and told the Queen that it really wasn't a very good idea to be writing these memoirs of her life with Brown. It would be misconstrued. She erupted with rage. However, she took the young man's advice, and the matter was never mentioned again. I wonder if it still survives somewhere in Windsor, in those archives, or whether Princess Beatrice, the wrecker, destroyed it. Thanks to Victoria's youngest daughter, Beatrice, no trace remains of the Queen's life with John Brown in her voluminous journals. We're left with silence as her children were intent on deleting Brown and anything else deemed unsuitable from history. It's poignantly sad that so avid a scribbler and recorder of her times as Queen Victoria should have had her words suppressed. And of course, the suppression has the precisely opposite effect upon us that it was intended to do. Instead of making us forget about John Brown and Victoria, it makes us obsessed by the subject. What we do know is that in favouring Brown, Victoria showed herself to be a woman desperate for companionship, irrespective of the social cost. She'd come such a long way from her days as the submissive wife of Albert. With Brown, she was free to do as she pleased. Of course, people suspected him of sleeping with Victoria. There's a bit of a feminist issue here. If she'd been a male monarch going to bed with a parlour maid, no one would have batted an eyelid. It's the idea of a woman crossing the class barrier that really appalled them. Especially as the rumours mounted to that of a secret marriage, even a love child, between the Queen and her Highland servant. A man who was probably one of the very few people in the world who ever knew the full truth about her relationship with Brown was her last doctor, Sir James Reed. Oh, goodness. The whole collection. Michaela, Lady Reed, is married to his grandson. He kept a diary while he yes. worked with her. Yes, and there are 40 little, little tiny diaries here. See, his writing was minuscule. Oh, isn't it wonderful? Yes. If you read a lot, you really require a magnifying glass. Yes. And here are some more diaries. Yes, uh, this is one from March. This is uh, the Queen and Brown, I think. Yes, she has a fall. They were going up and down the stairs, Brown and the Queen. It was Brown, of course, carried her. Reed wasn't well, allowed so much as to touch her. Well, he was allowed to offer his arm. But, I mean, he wasn't allowed to examine her. No, 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 and certainly wouldn't be allowed to carry her up and down the stairs. Whereas Brown was allowed to enfold yes, her in his arm. Yes, 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 and they were laughing about it all and thought it was great fun. And then, and then the next day, it says, the Queen walked a little in the room. Brown lifts his kilt and says, is it there? And she lifts her skirt laughing and says, no, it's here. She was moving his big man yes, hand yes. from the side of her bottom. bottom. <laughs> yes, but I think she's pointing, she's lifting probably her pointing long skirt but also and the pointing idea of a woman lifting knee. her skirt in those days. Yes, yes, no, no, it was very raff, forward. It was raffish. They were obviously very intimate.
Is there a feeling <laughs> in the Reed family that um, Dr. Reed knew the nature of the relationship? Yes, there is a feeling. And we used to tease Granny, as we called her, his widow, about uh, John Brown and the relationship. And she would always shut, clam she up. She clammed up. Yeah, she just laughed and dismissed it. What do you think? I don't think they were married. I don't think they even had an immoral affair. I think that they expressed their feelings so much in public. Had they been having an affair, they, they would have um, been more circumspect about it. There's also the kind of physical detail that we now know yeah. because of Dr. Reed examining her body after she died, isn't there? Yes, she had a prolapsed uterus, which would have made any form of intercourse extremely painful, probably impossible. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it was that sort of relationship, and no. I certainly don't think uh, that she would have had a child, because she was... Oh, too, no, that's uh, preposterous. I'm preposterous, sure. which preposterous. has been said. Oh, yes, it has. When anybody knows that I'm writing about Queen Victoria, they've always been asking me the same question. What was the relationship between John Brown and the Queen? Were they lovers? And I'm afraid to say that on that question, I'm a complete agnostic. It's plainly not a relationship like that between her and Albert. She was so open about loving Brown, about wanting Brown to hold her and carry about him public and love with her, that I'm sure there was no kind of secret, covert relationship going on. I think the likeliest thing, if you actually wanted to force me to make up my mind, is that they had a tactile, loving relationship which involved lots of hugging, but that they weren't lovers in the true sense of the word. Victoria was never one for convention. Despite giving her name to an era of propriety and prudishness, Victoria was anything but. Where she loved the openness of Brown, she couldn't stand those who were reserved around her. So when it came to her buttoned-up Liberal Prime Minister, W.E. Gladstone, she had no tolerance at all. Mr. Gladstone is a very dangerous man, and so very arrogant, tyrannical and obstinate, with no knowledge of the world or human nature. Victoria was not one to mince her words. She used every weapon in her armory her psychological illnesses, her physical illnesses, to combat what she believed were assaults by the Liberals on the monarchy itself. Her undisguised loathing of this humorless intellectual state showed how very self-assertive Queen Victoria could be. Gladstone was awkward with the Queen, and like his hero, Prime Minister Robert Peel, he didn't have the best way with women. Thirty years after her run-in with Peel, Victoria showed herself to be just as belligerent with Gladstone as she had been in her youth. One such occasion occurred in the summer of 1869, when the Lord Mayor of London and Gladstone asked her to open the new Blackfriars Bridge. The Queen was determined to wriggle out of it, and the drama went on and on through the summer and autumn with Gladstone bearing the brunt of most of the Queen's emotional outbursts. She thought she had clearly expressed that it was impossible for her to open Blackfriars Bridge, but as Mr Gladstone seems still in doubt, she will repeat her sincere regret that it is quite out of the question for her to do anything of the kind in the heat of the summer. The Republicans, the press, but also the Queen monarchists were all asking themselves the same question. If the country functioned perfectly well, with the head of state spending most of her year either up in Balmoral or down on the Isle of Wight, why did we need a monarch at all? And it was to silence that question that the Prime Minister, Mr. Gladstone, was determined to parade the little woman on this bridge. And she was equally determined not to be bullied and not to be put under pressure. As July wore on, the Queen dug in her heels. The Queen is much surprised at being again teased and tormented about this bridge, having three weeks ago nearly been asked by Mr Gladstone. And she refused to open it, saying, the fatigue of the whole thing being much too great, with the day commencing in the heat. Ever one for mood swings, 
But when it came to the event, Victoria decided she could open the bridge. But what a palaver she had caused in doing so. Frequently caught in the crossfire between Gladstone and his queen was her private secretary, Colonel Henry Punsonby. His great-granddaughter, Laura Punsonby, is the keeper of many a letter penned by Victoria's idiosyncratic hand. <laughs> the Queen's handwriting oh, yes. was almost illegible. Incredibly difficult to read. I think I'm getting worse at it. <laughs> <laughs> there are other wonderful these deep black borders, aren't they? Aren't they? These little letters were, were coming out of uh, the Queen's writing desk every 10 minutes. <laughs> That's right. My feeling is that Gladstone found Queen Victoria almost impossible to deal with, whereas Henry Ponsonby was far better at dealing with her. Henry Ponsonby knew what he was doing, I think, in a way. He did all he could to try and make the Queen more reasonable with Gladstone, but she was very, very critical about him. Henry Ponsonby knew that it was no good contradicting her. There was a famous story about him that he says, when I say two and two make four, Queen Victoria says, no, they make five. And then he says again, no, I, I, th I think they do make four. And she says, no, you're wrong. Then he said, I leave it, I let it drop. And then we go back to it and then it's okay. He knew if he said no, Queen Victoria would immediately dig her heels right in. You know, Henry Ponsonby admired her. She could be absolutely impossible, of course, but he managed to sort of cope with it. And of course, he had a great sense of humour. I think that was the saving thing, wasn't it? He could see how very funny she was. <laughs> That's right. And he got them all laughing at the dinner table. He said he looks round at Queen Victoria and she's absolutely, you know, giggling away. She was known as Furia, mad laugh, Furia. Um, and that you start laughing and then tears come to your eye and you shake and all this sort of laughter comes up. She had a lot of furia, didn't she? Yes, she had a lot of furia. She was always having the giggles. Yes. Gladstone wasn't particularly humorous. No, no, I think not. It was the weird mix of Victoria's humor and hysteria that the politicians couldn't come to terms with. So much so, they feared for her sanity. And you can see why the establishment were worried when you look at the correspondence between the Queen and Mr. Gladstone. Now, we look at this. When Gladstone went to stay in Balmoral, he was awkward and couldn't speak to the Queen. She often refused to speak to him. So they would correspond while they were both living in the same house, sometimes as often as six times a day. The letters are particularly comic, I think, really. Uh, Gladstone, his letters, beautifully written, a little pompous, absolutely rational. And she scrawls frenziedly back. It's as if somebody's streaming through paper. Here's one which was written in the afternoon. Just an outburst, really. It is not to Tahiti, but to Honolulu, that the complaints relative to Prince Alfred refer. What that was about, who knows? History doesn't relate. But you do see what Mr Gladstone was up against. Victoria capriciously showed her Prime Minister time and time again that she was queen and he couldn't bully her into doing something she didn't want to do. Victoria maintained her hostility to Gladstone to his dying day. The grand old man clung to office long after he became physically incapable. On and off, he was Prime Minister for 26 years. I think the most disgraceful thing about Queen Victoria is the way she behaved to Gladstone at the time of his resignation. He devoted his entire life to the service of his country, and she offered him not one word of thanks. She trusts he will be able to enjoy peace and quiet with his excellent and devoted wife in health and happiness, and that his eyesight may improve. The Queen would gladly have conferred a peerage on Mr Gladstone, but she knows he would not accept. Gladstone's decline and death had little effect on the Queen. Years ago, she had unashamedly fallen for his political opponent, Benjamin Disraeli, whose One Nation Toryism was her kind of politics. Besides, he knew how to make her laugh. 
At Disraeli's private home in the heart of Buckinghamshire, curator Robert Bandy is the proud keeper of the numerous gifts Victoria lavished on Disraeli. This is the dining room. We have an awful lot of portraits in the house to get from the Queen, and all of them have a crown on the top to tell us exactly who they came from. In case it could be in any doubt. <laughs> in, ca in case it could be in any doubt, exactly. An unconventional visit to Hewenden in 1877 showed Disraeli's political skill and charm. When Disraeli collected the Queen from Wickham Station, he took two carriages with him, one with slightly faster horses, so he could welcome the Queen for the first time on the platform. Obviously, great statesman, showman, lots of bowing and dipping. Very theatrical. Very, very theatrical. People in Wickham loved it. He popped into the first carriage with the quicker horses, got back to Hewenden before the Queen so he could welcome her in exactly the same way, but for a second time, once she got to the front door of the manor. That's delicious. And um, he obviously was mindful she was a slightly short lady and had the bottom two inches of her dining chair <laughs> sawn off so that her feet were flat on the floor when she sat. If she'd sat on a normal chair, of course, her feet would have been dangling in the air. And he didn't think that was particularly becoming of um, the monarch. That's very funny. This is another present from her. So it's the collected speeches of, of Albert. This is very remarkable because at first she was a little bit... She disliked him entirely um, when he was just a member of the house, but he grew useful to her because whether she complained that Gladstone referred to her as though she were a public meeting, um, Disraeli gave her the opposite end of the spectrum. He gave her the tittle-tattle and the gossip, and he would write three or four notes a day to her from Parliament. And, of course, she had a very marked sense of humour, and uh, she liked the fact that he made accounts of Parliament and cabinets. Yes. That's so amusing. She laughed over his letter. Now, who have we here on the chimney piece? We've got um, John Brown, given by the Queen to Disraeli, two relative outsiders, Disraeli, the most unlikely Victorian Prime Minister, and Brown, completely out of the normal social sphere for the Queen, that was drawn in closest to her. Very much so. Both Brown and Disraeli gave Victoria the loyalty she always longed for, and she lapped up Dizzy's endless attention and flattery. He is so full of poetry romance and chivalry. When he knelt down to kiss my hand, which he took in both of his, he said, in loving loyalty and faith. Disraeli not only amused and flirted with Victoria, he understood her emotional struggles in life. Professor Jane Ridley has written biographies of both Disraeli and Queen Victoria. Disraeli didn't treat her as a stupid woman. Uh, Disraeli treated her as a sort of exotic and wonderful queen. He also treated her as an equal. He made her feel, by writing her these wonderful um, sort of confidential letters, uh, that he was telling her everything and that he was her minister and together they were ruling the country. Um, so he made her feel, feel good. She wasn't, you know, before she'd had this awful generation of um, those dreadful old men, she called them, who talked down to her and, and didn't sort of... Um, uh, flatter her in this way. But Disraeli is on his knees flattering her right from day one, and she loves it. <laughs> <laughs> Who wouldn't? <laughs> People smiled at Victoria's crush on Disraeli and at his shameless camp manipulation of it. He dubbed her the fairy or the fairy queen. He was genuinely fond of her, but he was prepared to exploit the friendship for political ends. Britain was moving to a position where eventually every male adult would have the vote. And many politicians feared this would mean an inevitable lurch to the left. Disraeli had his finger on the pulse. He knew there were thousands and thousands of lower middle class and working class men who were natural Tories. Victoria became the perfect figurehead for Disraeli's one nation conservatism. His plans involved Victoria as a symbol of British power, not just at home, but stretching far across the world to the empire. Showing both political astuteness and glorious creativity, Disraeli announced Victoria was the Empress of India on January the 1st, 1877. She was delighted with the new title. My thoughts much taken up with the great event at Delhi today and in India generally, where I am being proclaimed Empress of India. I have for the first time today signed myself as V, R and I. Empress of India. 
It's a title you might think more appropriate for a railway engine, or possibly even a pig. But it made Britain an imperial power. India, in all its exotic expanse, now came under the royal dominion of the fairy. Of course, sophisticated people flinched at the title. But Victoria and Israeli knew that the vast proportion of the British people thought the empire made Britain rich. And for the next 80 years, the empire was the pride of Britain's conservatives and the envy of many beyond its borders. As she'd instinctively used her diplomatic skills in Germany in the years following Albert's death, Victoria leaped at the chance to stand at the helm of Disraeli's political ideals to galvanize Britain's classes under a powerful monarch. There's a glorious romance about being Victoria R.I. Uh, rather than simply Victoria Regina. It was a real publicity coup in India. Victoria is extraordinarily popular. They see her as almost a goddess figure, even though she never went there in her life. You know, she has this extraordinary common sense about sort of predicting uh, what's going to happen and about politics. And in, about the Empress of India thing, she was absolutely right. It was a really astute political... It was, moment. wasn't it? Yes. Mm. But the pair's political romance couldn't last forever. Disraeli fought on in politics to his dying day. Victoria showered attention on him right to the end bestowing on him a peerage as Lord Beaconsfield. At his death, she was distraught. I cannot write in the third person at this terrible moment, when I can scarcely see for my fast-falling tears. Victoria made the most extraordinary confession to her friend, Lady Waterpark. I know you will feel for me in my great and irreplaceable loss. I have lost so many but none whose loss will be more heavily felt than this of dear Lord Beaconsfield. They are remarkable words when you consider how recently she'd lost her beloved daughter Alice and how intensely she'd mourned the Prince Consort. They show how close Victoria had become, both in politics and in her heart, to Dizzy. Gladstone was the dictatorial prime minister. Disraeli was the true and trusted friend. As if the death of Disraeli wasn't enough for Victoria to cope with, just two years later came the death of the man who may have been the love of her life, John Brown. The Queen was devastated. The fatherless widow was alone again. The extent of Victoria's grief on paper is only known in part. These words escaped the ruthless Windsor censorship. I am terribly upset by this loss, which removed one who was so devoted and attached to my service, who did so much for my personal comfort. It is the loss not only of a servant, but of a real friend. Through love and loss, time and time again, Victoria had the remarkable fortitude to carry on in the midst of grief. Far from her widowhood constraining her, she had the strength to reinvent herself and was visibly a new woman aged 68, celebrating her golden jubilee. The crowds from the palace gates up to the abbey were enormous. This never to be forgotten day will always leave the most gratifying and heart-stirring memories behind. The celebrations didn't end in London. They extended far across the reaches of the empire, in India. Am I in India? No, I'm on the Isle of Wight. I'm in the Durbar Room. Victoria added this fantastic wing to Prince Albert's Italianate villa. And what a symbol of her liberation from the Albertian past, her dominion, her imaginative grasp of her empire and of the world itself had expanded so much in her life. It's utterly fantastic. Victoria had never been to India, but she always had a great affection for its peoples. She'd far rather hear exotic stories of India than talk to her boring Oxford-educated politicians. And so it was decided in her jubilee year 
that a taste of India would be sent to her in England in the form of two Indian servants from Agra. One of those servants would turn out to be her last great attachment. The man in question was 24-year-old Abdul Karim. Hired as little more than a footman, he was to become the new subject of Victoria's male affections. Abdul Karim, much lighter, tall, and with a fine, serious countenance. Victoria loved the company of Abdul Karim. And now, down the corridors of Osborn House, the wafted the delicious aromas of the spices he'd brought with him from Agra. Cinnamon, cloves, turmeric, cumin, nutmeg, drowning out the pong of overboiled cabbage and mutton. And there he is. Abdul Karim brought with him India in all its color and splendor, which Victoria welcomed wholeheartedly into her court. Shrabani Basu is the author of the best-selling book on Abdul Karim and Queen Victoria. Unlike Brown, he was a married man. He was a married man, and his wife came to the court as well. Mrs. Karim, as she was called, she was veiled, and he was a good Indian family. He not only got his mother, he got his mother-in-law as well. So there were several of these Borka-clad Muslim ladies around the throne, as it were. Yes. The Queen was so excited because um, she said it's the first Parda ladies in court. If Victoria liked a servant she didn't hold back, Abdul was soon promoted to the position of the Munshi, the Queen's Indian teacher. She wanted to learn about the ordinary people of India, and this was really important to her. She wants to learn the language, and he gives her the everyday phrases, and she shows off, she loves showing off. She has these Indian princes come, and what better than casually use a Hindustani phrase? What were the useful everyday phrases that he taught her? Well, there were the standard things like, uh, you know, tea is too hot, or the egg is not boiled enough. <laughs> uh, but there were also intriguing phrases like, um, I will miss the Munshi very much, and hold me tight. Um, <laughs> where did that come from? That's very charming, isn't it? Do you think she did hold him tight? <laughs> I suppose so. <laughs> it was a relationship on so many levels. You know, it was mother, son, grandmother, son. It was a uh, closest friend. And at the same time, Queen Victoria liked a strong man next to her. If you see the pattern from John Brown, he was six feet tall, a strong man, um, somebody who cared for her, and the same, Abdul Karim, six feet two, um, standing next to her, looking after her. Definitely the physical, the sensual element was very much part of it. I think that's very revealing. <laughs> None of Victoria's English courtiers liked the Munshi. They thought he was John Brown in a turban, but Victoria seemed not to notice, or perhaps chose to ignore their snobbish and racist feelings towards him. Writing to Vicky, Victoria's words were all praise. He is so good and gentle and understanding. All I want, and is a real comfort to me. Such a good influence with the others. Anything Abdul Karim wanted, he would get. If he wants a nice room, he's given the room. He's given John Brown's old room, and that is noticed. She gives him his own carriage to ride around. He goes around Balmoral. He goes to India on holiday. Can you tell us about what the attitude of the courtiers was towards Abdul? As soon as he started getting all the favors, the resentment started as well. And the queen accuses them all the time of racism. And she insists that they behave uh, courteously to him, which they don't. I mean, the Munshi invites it because he is a bit arrogant and a bit full of himself. He does strut around, he does rule over, lord over the other Indian servants, but that's the position he's been given. Although unrest at court was mounting, Victoria didn't seem to care. She was simply not going to give up her fondness for her new best friend. And a shameless display of favoritism in June 1890 further incensed her household. The queen lost a brooch while she was clambering into her carriage, one of the footmen said that he'd seen Abdul Karim's brother-in-law, Hormit Ali, hovering about at the time. Somebody told Mrs. Tuck, the Queen's dresser, that Ali had pinched the brooch and sold it to the jewelers in Windsor. Then they got a note from the jeweler to prove it. The Queen was furious, not with the thief, but with Mrs. Tuck. She claimed 
that in India it was perfectly normal to pick things out which didn't belong to you, and it wasn't considered dishonesty at all. And then she rounded on Mrs. Tuck. This is what you English call justice. You English, coming from the Queen, who had escaped to Germany when times had dropped tough, and although she'd spent the previous 50 years on the throne, evidently never really felt at home in Britain itself. As with other members of the court, Dr. Reed wasn't keen on how much time the Queen devoted to the Munchie, especially as he was so often unwell. He had to look after the Munchie, and he sometimes was kept up till midnight, you know, and he was at his wit's end. The Queen went several times to see him in his room and stroked his hand, taking Hindustani lessons, stroking his neck, and smoothing his pillows. One doesn't want to be too indelicate, but what was the matter with the poor Munchie? Oh, well, first of all, he'd had scabies, but that was a bit better. But this was a big boil on his neck. How did Reed and the Munchie get along? Oh, um, uh, <laughs> Reed disliked the Munchie hugely. Thought he was a bad egg. He was horrible to his fellow Indians and felt his sense of superiority over all the others. Can you see what she saw in the Munchie? It was clearly Reed couldn't really understand no, it, would he? No, I think what she... He was exotic and he was a symbol of India. Victoria, oblivious to convention, turned a blind eye to the unhappy members of her court. But things came to a head when she insisted that Munchie join her on her annual trip to the sunny Riviera. Victoria had always loved coming to France as a place of escape, travelling around in the years after Albert's death under the name of the Countess of Balmoral. France represented freedom for Victoria. And in 1897, a royal trip to Simier was planned, staying at the swanky new Excelsior Hotel with superb views of the Mediterranean. Drove through the town, along the fine Promenade des Anglais, close to the sea, which looked so lovely in a wonderful deep blue colour. The holiday plans were going awry. An almighty row was about to break out in the household, precipitated by Dr. Reed, who most improperly told the others that the poor Munchie had yet again gone down with a dose of the clap, gonorrhea. They seized on this as the perfect excuse to say, if the Munchie went to Nice, they weren't coming. They were going to be on strike. This precipitated the mother of all tantrums. Mrs. Phipps is chosen to go tell the Queen that if the Munshi goes, we are not going to go. We are going to collectively resign. This is revolt. And the Queen hears this and she gets into a screaming rage. She gets up, she throws everything down from the table. So all these letters, pots, ink pens crashing down. Mrs. Phipps leaves the room in tears and she goes back and tells them what's happened. So at the end of the day, they don't resign, and the Munshi travels, as he always does, uh, with the Queen. So, you know, it's a victory for the Munshi. And it was victory for the Queen, too. But when Victoria paraded with the Munshi on Nice's famous Promenade des Anglais, one of the local newspapers described the Munshi as a mere servant. The Queen was infuriated and insisted that the newspaper print a retraction, stating, that the Munchie was a learned man. Far from being her servant, he was her Indian secretary, her preceptor in the Hindustani town. And, moreover, one of the most important personnages auprès de la reine. The Queen was always insistent that the Munchie be respected. Remember, he is my Indian secretary and considered as a gentleman in my suite. In Victoria's eyes, a gentleman wasn't a wealthy landowner. It was someone who had admirable qualities, no matter their class or race. I find it one of Victoria's most lovable qualities, her complete lack of snobbishness and her disregard for social constraint. This was the woman who'd been supposedly crippled by the death of her husband at the age of 42, but had become so much more than the widow in black. 
Victoria spent the last 40 years of her life after Albert finding freedom in the most unlikely of relationships. And despite living life shying away from the public, she emerged as an icon of the era, a picture of British power. Just four years before her death, the streets of London were lined with her public, celebrating her diamond jubilee in 1897. No one ever, I believe, has met with such an ovation as was given to me. Passing through those six miles of streets, the cheering was quite deafening and every face seemed to be filled with joy. Victoria died in January 1901 after a remarkable 63 years on the throne. And more than a century after her death, her words still command our attention. Victoria had written instructions which she gave to her dresser, Mrs. Tuck, and to the doctor, Dr. Reed. And they told what she wanted to be put in her coffin with her when she died. She was to have the Prince Consort's dressing gown. She was to have various photographs of favorite grandchildren and servants. And she was to have locks of their hair. Perhaps most significant, she was to be holding a framed photograph of John Brown, and on her finger was the ring which he'd given her as his mother's wedding ring. As one walks past that mausoleum at Frogmore, which is nearly always closed, it's a strange thought to think of her lying there, surrounded by all her mementos. The image is emblematic of a queen who liked drama in life and now in death. But sadly, the image isn't one her children could tolerate. All traces of the Queen's unconventional attachments were erased. The Munchie was deported. Her children tried to edit their mother's life, destroying statues of John Brown, censoring her journals, burning her letters. But many of her words survive, and they provide a fascinating insight into this extraordinary human being. Victoria had overcome her pressurized childhood in a controlling political system and had fought through the power struggles of her marriage to a man who had restrained her. In the midst of grief, she emerged as a woman free to move in the world of politics and make deep friendships without constraint. And in all this, she revealed herself a woman who was anything but Victorian. Far from being prim and proper, she loved life in all its richness. She was blind to class and color, and contrary to what we think, had a great sense of humor. When you look at this statue, she seems so stiff, so formal, the Queen Empress. But hear her words, and Victoria lives. 